demanding to be in attendance as we are taxpayers. The meeting is online. All the PowerPoint presentations will be shared with every member after the meeting. And uh, we are also recording the meeting as well, too. So anybody that does have an, op an opportunity to partake, we will share the, uh, the recording with them as well. Are you recording this conversation? Yes, we are. OK, good, because we're going to go to the newspaper when oh, we're sure sitting on this and uh, let people know that the citizens requested mm -hmm. in, to be in attendance and there was no exceptions made. And as I said, it doesn't matter how many times you repeat it, we are still requesting mm -hmm. access. Right. Let's start the meeting. Okay, so I think we've admitted everybody and certainly as people are, are entering in, we'll admit them as we do, uh, but certainly want to welcome everybody tonight's uh, to our meeting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, just so that everybody has an opportunity to, to hear the information being presented, we have muted everybody and certainly we'll be given an opportunity to everybody to ask questions uh, later on in the in the session. So first off, um, I'd like to uh, give it to the to our mayor, Jeff Shaver, to uh, welcome the remarks. Okay, good evening and welcome. For the purpose of this online information session, regarding the anaerobic digester being built in the industrial park on County Road 2 is to explain the township's role in this project and to outline next steps in the process. This meeting will include myself, Jeff Shaver, my deputy mayor, Adrian Winans, my CAO, Shannon Garrity, my planner, Melissa Banford, and Claire Allen, Vice President of Operations at CH4 Biogas, which is the proponent's consultants. At this time, I'll hand the meeting over to Shannon to explain the meeting procedure. Thank you. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, these presentations will be shared with all the members that registered today. So uh, after the meeting, we'll we'll circulate this to the email list we have uh, with the information. The PowerPoint. Can everyone see the PowerPoint presentation? They're all on mute. Oh, they're mute. Okay. Can someone unmute and, and let us know if you can see that? Okay. You have to unmute them. Oh, okay, we, we can unmute them. We can unmute them. Oh, request for him. No, we, we can't see just the uh, an individual you can't, TV. You, you can't see the PowerPoint? No. Okay. Just give no. One, no. one second. I just minimize it. Sorry. Yeah, share. So share. Uh, share. Yeah. To your right. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Go down to the windows where it says there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And look for the presentation. Maybe the digester one, okay. October 5th. So down, down, through there. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. No, yeah, that one there. Whoop. That's it. Okay. Could somebody unmute themselves and just let me know if you see the presentation now? Yeah, we can there start. now. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So certainly, uh, certainly tonight we we want to take some time to to kind of go over the the application that was submitted by H and G Properties. Um, so uh, we'll be going through a series of slides, and then we'll also pass it over to the consultant from CH4 that will provide further information on the current works that are being done on that property. Um, I will. I will uh, stress at this time that this meeting is an information meeting. Um, this information is a information session, so uh, we would appreciate on both sides, you know, uh, respect on both sides as well as professionalism. And certainly we are want to be here to answer your questions. And certainly if we do not get through all your questions today, uh, I will ask that you submit your questions or comments to myself. And what we'll do is circulate them between our planner and uh, the consultant to uh, get a response to all your questions or clarifications that are needed. <clears throat> so um, first off, you know, there's some of them, some of you that might already know uh, the, the application. So 
The application was submitted on June 2nd of 2021 to MECP uh, from h and Properties for a new environmental compliance approval um, for a waste disposal site anaerobic digestion facility at 1336 County Road 2 in the Township of Augusta. The application was to permit the facility to receive combination organic residuals from source separated organics and commercial and industrial food-based materials to produce renewable natural gas for injection into the natural gas grid and digestate or organic fertilizer. While the original notice requested comments from the township within six weeks of the June 2nd letter, the town, the town uh, discussions with MECP staff resulted in the comment period extending for the township to January 7th, of 2022. In the fall of 2021, the township retained EVV engineering out of Cornwall to complete a review of the environmental requirements for the biogester proposal. Included in the review was a literature uh, review and a council presentation and a site tour. H&D Properties held a virtual public meeting regarding their proposal on December 7th of 2021. Questions were invited to be submitted prior to the meeting and were responded to as part of the meeting. Uh, at a meeting on December 13th of 2021, EVB presented its findings and an update on the review of the biogas facilities uh, from HD at H and D property proposal. The EVB presentation is made available on our township website. And certainly if uh, people have not had an opportunity to review that, I'm more than happy to share that uh, with, the, with the group. Uh, the presentation recommended various questions and inquiries for the township to include in the comments to MECP. Questions and inquiries from members of council were submitted to the CAO for inclusion in the township's response to MECP. EVB came as other installations for site tour However, it has been determined that there is currently no other facility operating with similar technology to that proposed in this application. And certainly Claire will go through some of that technology in her presentation. As part of our due diligence, township staff reached out to the City of London, uh, where the Storm Fisher facility has been operating for approximately nine years. Uh, based on their experience, uh, London staff shared some of their learnings, which were part of our submission to MECP. And detailed comments and questions were submitted uh, to MECP by the township by the requested date of January 31st, 2022. So to date, uh, MECP on August 15th, August 21st, uh, approved two uh, compliance of approvals for two ECAs, one for the noise and air and one for the waste. Some of the conditions within the approval, it's, it's, it's quite a big document, uh, is to establish and to maintain a public liaison committee for the site. Also, the owner shall create a website for the site and shall post the documentation. Documentation will describe the current operations of the site, as well as the docu documentation uh, to be prepared and kept the site, or to be prepared and submitted to the Ministry of Review as required by the ECA. So now I'll turn it over to our planner who will go through the zoning confirmation as well as the site plan uh, approvals. Thank you. So the, uh, the subject property is zoned MP, uh, which is our industrial park zone. Um, it, that does zone does permit a, a number of extensive uh, list of uses, uh, one of which is, uh, is defined as manufacturing. Um, so throughout this whole process, the township uh, did previously have two planning opinions. Um, confirming that the property is appropriately zoned to permit manufacturing. Um, however, part of this review was suggested by our engineer, um, EVB, that we seek a further opinion uh, to confirm the zoning for the proposed use. Um, the township then sought um, and received a legal opinion um, from a certified specialist in municipal law, uh, municipal government and land use planning, um, that the proposed use complies with the current zoning of the property. Um, they indicated that, in their opinion, it's a reasonable interpretation um, of the process proposed that it fits the definition of manufacturing in the zoning bylaw. The substance that's being produced is biofuel and digestate, which is fertilizer. So the um, 
Uh, the next steps of the process from the township is, is site plan, which does fall under the Planning Act. Um, the township is aware um, the facilities proposed in the application are approved and regulated by NECP, um, as well as their environmental officers. Um, so beyond the submission of the comments to NECP and their approval of the application, um, this is outside of the municipality's control. Um, that because they have the approvals through the certificates uh, and it means they're operating conditions for the facility. Um, however, what is within township control is the site plan approval. Um, so uh, bylaw uh, 3573 uh, 22 um, did delegate authority um, for site plan approval uh, to the chief administrative officer. Uh, this was a provincial requirement by Bill 109 that councils were, are no longer permitted to uh, approve site plans. Uh, that happened July of last year. Uh, it was our deadline. We had to delegate it uh, to someone other than council. Uh, that's all that was given to the CAO. Um, so part of the site plan approval process, um, when the township receives a site plan application, if it's deemed complete, so the Planning Act does require us to approve it, uh, make a decision within 60 days. Um, the submission of site plan approval, typical items that are, are requested and assessed uh, include the location of building structures to be erected so we can confirm that it complies with zoning, um, additional parking to make sure there's sufficient parking on the site, uh, refuge storage, uh, any road widening uh, that would be requested by the counties, um, exterior lighting, uh, loading facilities, any easements or right of way. Um, and uh, lot grading and drainage will be assessed, um, as well as outside storage vehicle access to ensure that um, uh, vehicles, as well as emergency vehicles, can appropriately access the site. Um, any pedestrian access is, is, is appropriate, and there will be appropriate buffering and landscaping um, for the property. So the, uh, the applicant uh, and consultant is currently in the process of finalizing a site plan submission with the township. Um, it's not been deemed complete at this point, but we have received some documentation and application from them. Um, the submission includes a traffic impact study, uh, a scoped environmental impact assessment, uh, stormwater management report, uh, including a lot of grading and drainage plan. Uh, so the site plan will be assessed by township staff uh, in relation to the zoning compliance. So we'll be looking at the setbacks, parking provisions, height maximums, um, those, those kind of things. Um, other commenting agencies will be circulated on the site plan once it is deemed complete. Uh, these will include South Nation Conservation, uh, CN Rail, uh, and the counties of Leeds and Grenville. Um, stormwater management and lot grading uh, will be peer reviewed by the township engineers. That's to ensure that there's going to be no off site impact uh, with respect to stormwater. Um, the scoped environmental impact study will be peer reviewed uh, by our environmental consultants. Um, and the traffic study uh, will be advanced to the Leeds again for Bellevue County. Uh, County Road 2 does, is under the ownership of the counties, so they will be responsible for commenting on the traffic study, um, any access requirements. Um, so uh, once everything's finalized and, and everything's been satisfied and, and appropriate mitigation measures have been in place, um, then a site plan agreement would be drafted, would be entered into the property owner, and would be registered on title to the property. So certainly from, from our, uh, our presentation uh, that has concluded, but we'll certainly now pass it over to the consultant. Uh, Claire has a, a PowerPoint presentation that she'll go through. And then as I indicated, we will also um, uh, have Claire and um, Melissa go through some of the questions we've received already with some of the responses. And then we'll certainly open it up to uh, members who, uh, residents who have other additional questions uh, that they'd like to ask. So just give us a second as we get the PowerPoint up for everyone. No, you gotta go back to share. Go to the teams. Go to stop sharing again and then we'll bring it up again. Okay, I'm going to go back to share. And go to your windows. And then the CH41. Perfect. 
Okay, we'll pass over to Claire. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Claire Allen. I am the VP of Operations at CH4 Biogas. I've worked at CH4 Biogas for about 15 years developing anaerobic digester projects uh, throughout North and South America. I would like to go through uh, how anaerobic digestion works and talk a little bit about the site plan. Uh, specifically, I'll talk about the site plan in relation to odor considerations. I know that's a big concern um, from most of the people probably on this meeting. So as I go through the site plan, I'll be trying to focus on odor control measures. So first of all, though, how does anaerobic digestion work? What we're basically doing is mimicking a human or animal stomach. Where, um, what we have is an organic reception building where we bring in organic waste that will be separated. Any contamination such as plastic particles or glass or grit will be separated from the organics. Uh, that material then is in a liquid slurry that we put into a hydrolyzer tank. Uh, basically, in anaerobic digestion, there's different bacteria uh, consuming the food and making gas and making a digestate product. And in the hydrolyzer, that's one step where we begin to break down the organics and make sure that they'll uh, release the energy in the anaerobic digester tank. So material will flow from a hydrolyzer tank into an anaerobic digester tank. All of these are covered tanks. And then finally, through a pasteurization process um, before the liquid, that's a di it's called digestate, it's a fertilizer, is removed from the facility in, in enclosed trucks and creating biogas, which we clean um, and then can use as a natural gas product. So heating homes, power and gas, things that are in people's homes, that's what the product will be used for in the end. The next thing. So I have a site plan up. Um, I was hoping I could use a mouse to show people, but um, you see truck number 20 on the slide is a, a truck entering the facility. So all of the trucks that enter the facility are enclosed trucks and the vents from all of the trucks will have um, odor control on them. So any air being displaced would go through an activated carbon filter. Thank you. Um, they enter the facility at point number 21. They go over a waste scale. And you can see the pink lines on the drawing show the, the way that the traffic will flow through the facility. They'll enter in into an enclosed building. You see 13, 14, and 15 is an enclosed building. This whole building operates under negative pressure. That means the pressure inside the building um, is operated so that if a door, when a bay door opens to let a truck in, air can't escape through the door of the building and rather it will be sucked with a blower through an odor control system and when a bay door opens to let a truck enter the building an air curtain is engaged as an extra barrier for any odors to to leave the building trucks come in the doors are closed nothing is unloaded from a truck until the doors are closed once the truck is unloaded the trucks are washed and then a truck will immediately leave the facility they're not waiting on the facility they're in there to deposit their load and leave all of the material that's offloaded, um, it's offloaded onto a tipping floor and inspected to see if there's any large contamination or debris. Those would be removed from the process. Uh, the trucks are washed and within 24 hours, everything that is in the building will be processed. It should be quicker than that, but that is the legal requirement is within 24 hours. So all of the material goes through a cleaning step inside an enclosed building and any contaminants are removed and then the liquid would flow into, you can see tank number, um, sorry, number 18. It's at the bottom of the site. That's a holding tank, a closed liquid holding tank. So material is pumped into there from the, the building, all enclosed, there's no outdoor access to anything. And from that holding tank into the anaerobic digester, which is number one, on, on the site plan drawing. And within that one tank, it's completely closed again. And the hydrolyzer tank is one portion of that tank. In the middle is the anaerobic digester. And on the other side is the pasteurization process. So then once material is pasteurized and leaving the facility, all of the loading of material is done in the enclosed building at section number 13 on the site plan. 
so material isn't loaded at any point, offloaded or unloaded outside. Um, so that's the site plan that I wanted to go through. Can you go to the next slide? So just to review the odor considerations for the facility, the trucking, it's enclosed trucks. There's no open, uh, open trucks coming in with organic waste. Tankers all have activated carbon filters on the vent and all the displaced air from the truck is filtered before it goes into the atmosphere. All of the storage, the storage tank to hold material once it's been pre-treated, those are also integrated into the odor control system. So no air from those tanks is released to the atmosphere before it's treated. With the receiving building, everything is received and offloaded within the building. There's no out, outdoor storage of any kind. Organics are processed within 24 hours. There's negative pressure within the building, ensuring that all air is treated through the order control system. The doors are fast acting doors with air curtains. And the activated carbon filters, we actually have one, we have three. One is sized to treat all of the air, but all of the air will go through one and then through a second activated carbon filter to provide uh, redundancy. And when activated carbon filters are being changed, we have three, so we can switch to using the third. So at no point will there be a lack of activated carbon filter. And there's also six air exchanges within the building. So every 10 minutes, you have completely new air within the building. It's um, the air isn't sitting in there to, to get odors. Then with the anaerobic digester tanks, they're completely enclosed and the gas is being captured within a flexible membrane on top. And so the gas isn't being held in there for any period of time. It's not sitting around, um, but it does contain it within an enclosed area and then it's piped to be clean. So the biogas, it's about 60% methane and we clean that so that we have a natural gas stream, which is methane that's clean enough to inject into the natural gas grid um, and carbon dioxide which is the other component of biogas is, is exhausted. Then the digester material, the digestate is practically odorless, um, but to be sure, um, to give peace, peace of mind, we do load and then uh, we do load digestate within an enclosed building just for extra peace of mind. Next slide. So the odor control system that we're using, we're working with a company named BioRamp. They have designed odor control systems for other organic processing facilities, other anaerobic digesters. I've listed a few of their names here and also for rendering plants, which are tend to be quite odorous. Um, so we, we're working with, they, they've been in business for 25 years in odor control and have a, a good trusted record within the province of Ontario and around the world. So just a little bit about activated carbon. Uh, it's a physical removal of odorous components. Uh, so the compounds are attracted. Uh, the carbon has a lot of surface area and the component compounds that have odor are attracted onto those surfaces and bound onto the surface. Thanks. So I wanted to lastly go through some of the safety features of the facility. Um, the whole facility is controlled through a SCADA system. So all of the data points that we're taking everywhere, temperature, pressure, uh, feed rate, anything is recorded on the SCADA system in real time with alarms that if a temperature, say it's a little too hot or a little too cold, the temperature um, alarm would be sent right away to the operators of the facility through this control system. So ideally, the the goal of the plant is to clean biogas and make renewable natural gas, but for safety we have a flare which can be used to burn the biogas if, if needed. And as extra safety on top of that, it's a requirement for the biogas code to have a, a pressure relief valve on all of the tanks. We do operate at really low pressures, um, two inches of water column, which if you can imagine two inches of water on something, it's not a lot of pressure. So throughout the system, we have sensors uh, for various gases. Um, as much automation as, as possible, we include. There's nothing, there's no operator who will, oh, turn on a valve to feed the digester and need to close it manually. That's all done by automation with alarms through the SCADA system. 
uh, we don't connect to the sewer system uh, except for for employee services, so bathrooms on site. No processed water from our facility is released to the atmosphere, and all of the tanks are enclosed. Nothing is open to the atmosphere. Uh, any processed water, so to wash down the trucks, like I mentioned, that's all treated within the anaerobic digester. So everything leaving the facility as, an, as a, is a treated organic as digestate to be used as fertilizer. The fertilizer will be uh, certified under CFAT as a fertilizer product. We don't use any any steam on site, so there's no high high pressure systems. And lastly, the biogas, I mentioned it, but the, there's only two inches of water column pressure within the double membrane holder. So it's two layers of membrane that hold the gas just temporarily before it's treating. That's, that's all that I had prepared for this evening. Okay. So maybe what we'll do then is go through with some of the questions that uh, you received, Claire or Melissa, and we'll, we'll provide some responses to some of those questions, and then we'll open the floor then to anybody that has a, a question. And um, when we get to the questions section, what we'll do is if uh, you can touch the raise your hand at the top of your screen, uh, it'll put all the all your uh, people in, in sequence, and we'll certainly then ask for you to unmute yourself, ask your question, and then mute yourself again so that uh, there could be a response to that. Did you want to uh, determine who you responded to for like? Sure, I'll okay. go through some of them. Okay, yeah. like I can help with the questions and okay. it's up to you. Um, sure. The ones from Mr. Shackles. Okay, sorry. Let me just go. Or is there? I can read the question. Sure, if you got it. Okay, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank so you. One of the questions we received said the operator, according to the permit to operate, must show the MECP proof that the facility is ready to operate specifically that odor and noise abatement equipment is functioning per specification three months before waste is consumed. Will the operator provide the township with a report on the ongoing monthly performance of this equipment and the operation in general after SU to be presented by the operator at regular council meeting and posted on the mandated website? So I believe that this question is referring to the environmental compliance approval, the ECA that was issued for the site. There isn't a specific permit to operate for the facility that's issued by the MECP. The ECA for the facility does not specify that the operator must provide proof that the operation of the order and noise abatement equipment is functioning three months prior to waste being delivered to the site. This would not be possible to do as prior to the receipt of organic matter at the facility, there would be no material on the site. The ECA permit does, however, require that three months prior to the receipt of material, a negative pressure assessment is carried out. This test ensures that the pressure in the building that will receive and pretreat organics is lower than the air pressure outside. This means that when the door, a bay door is opened, air will not flow outside, but rather through the odor control system for the building. The ECA requires the formation of a public liaison committee and the generation of a website. These two platforms will be used to communicate information regarding the operation of the facility. They'll be used uh, to disseminate um, information such as um, the requirements of the ECA. Do you want to speak to the council part of that question? Um, so I, I'm not sure. Uh, there's going to be on the mandated website. Um, I, I would have to maybe, um, it wouldn't be presented at a regular council meeting, I, I don't think, but, but that's something that uh, we can sort of discuss. Um, obviously, you know, there wants to be ongoing engagement, and I know there's an opportunity for a public liaison committee and, and all of that possibly. So. Um, so we can maybe discuss how to maybe we can respond to that. Um, get some further information. Yeah, if, if we could have an opportunity to respond to that, um, uh, that would be appreciated. The second question was the air on our property has been fresh and clean for 24 years. We spoke to residents of the Dingman Drive, London, Ontario, who live near a plant like yours. If you're emitting odorous, plant, odorous pollutants out of your stacks, why should we not be worried that the air in our neighborhood won't stink like theirs? 
I do understand your concerns regarding odors, and I understand that the London AD facility has had past odor complaints. I hope that you'll also consider that there are anaerobic digesters that had, uh, such as the Elmira plant, it had a, a lot of public opposition specifically regarding odors, and they did form a public liaison committee for, for complaints regarding the facility. And actually, eventually that committee was disbanded because there were no complaints and residents were, were satisfied with the operation of the facility. That's what we expect and hope for this facility as well. Our technology provider for the activated carbon filters is BioREM. They've been in business of odor control for 25 years and have a long track record of providing successful odor control equipment for organics processing facilities. The proponent, h and Properties, is committed to working with industry leaders to ensure that the facility becomes a source of pride for the community and not a source of odors. Um, the next question um, said, and I apologize, I'm not sure how to say your last name, but we are Ted and Heather, um, 1348 County Road 2. We live on the road leading into the plant. We share a fence line. We don't have AC and must sleep with our windows open. Today, the air in my home and backyard is fresh, but apparently we are a receptor site. I understand from the operators of the MEC permit that the air in my backyard could be contaminated with your plant emissions at one order unit on a good day, weather permitting. So there was the question was, what does that mean and how often will it occur? What could it be on a bad day? So I wanted to clarify a little bit on this. The odor assessment that was provided for the facility um, looks at the facility's impact on the community. So to perform these assessments, we used a U US EPA generated dispersion model that analyzes emissions from the facility and their impact on air quality. The dispersion modeling for the facility uses meteorological data that's generated and approved by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, and it contains wind and weather information over five years of data from this specific area with one data point every hour. So that's a lot of data, tens of thousands of meteorological data points are considered in the model. What that means is that the dispersion model for the facility considers all wind and weather conditions that are recorded, not just on a good day, but all of the days and every hour. For the odor assessment, your property was considered as a receptor point because we look at the nearest receptors surrounding the facility and your property is one of them. What we do with the dispersion model is ensure that the technology that's deployed at the site will meet the minimum requirement of one odor unit at a sensitive receptor. And an odor unit is how odor is measured. And what they have actually is a detection panel of people who smell odors and say when it's detected and that's considered one odor unit. So the dispersion model um, for your specific property over the five years of hourly data, there were no data points at one order unit. There were 16 data points, which is 0.04% of the data points where it was between 0.9 and 0.99 order units. But over 95% of the data points predict less than 0.1 order units of the residents. So the, the model that does use local air and weather information um, doesn't show that you'll be at one order unit at your property. And that's what will be required to demonstrate to the Ministry of Environment. The MEC, the next part of the question is the MEC permit says that there could be as many as six transports in some hours of the day or night. How will we sleep? Will the township or operator erect sound barriers around our property? Will trucks idle diesel exhaust all night on the access road? So to clarify, the ECA permit limits truck arrivals and departures during the daytime between 7 and 7 p.m. to a maximum of six trucks per 60-minute period. However, at night between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., it's limited to a maximum of one truck per 60-minute period. So there won't be trucks uh, all night long coming at six and an hour. The proponent had an acoustic assessment carried out for the proposed facility, which was reviewed and approved by the Ministry of Environment, which included monitoring of existing noise levels at various sensitive receptors around the facility. The design of the facility takes into consideration the existing noise conditions and ensures that the facility will meet noise requirements. 
The results of the acoustic assessment did not include the recommendation to erect a sound barrier around your property. There is no intention to have trucks idle at the facility. Uh, there are four enclosed shipping and receiving bays. The trucks enter the facility into an enclosed building, offload, get cleaned, and then leave. The ECA permit requires that an acoustic audit be carried out no later than three months after the facility begins operation to ensure that the facility is actually meeting the noise requirements. Um, one of the next questions is, um, who will monitor the odor levels and what penalty is imposed if odor exceeds the healthy limits? So odor emissions are monitored by the proponent um, in a variety of ways through real-time monitoring with this data system that I mentioned earlier. So they'll monitor continuously on the stacks for hydrogen sulfide emissions. We monitor continuously to ensure there's negative pressure within the reception building. We monitor continuously for blower use to ensure the air is going to the odor control system. And there's also visual inspections of the odor control system and the media within it. Secondly, the ECA permit requires source testing for odors and emissions uh, from the odor control unit six months after the receipt of any waste of the site and then every year after that. Uh, it could be changed to be more frequent or less frequent depending on um, directed by the district manager of the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. So I was, uh, once the, if the facility is built and operating, the complaints go to the Kings, Kingston District Office of the Ministry of Environment. And I reached out to them to see who is responsible for dealing with facilities that are non-compliant with their ECA. And they wrote back to me and I wanted to read what was what they said. They said events of non-compliance are to be reported to this office and action will be taken by the Kingston District Office. As a penalty for non-compliance with the ECA, there isn't a concrete answer to this question as any number of variables play into determine what action actions the ministry will take if a company is found to be in non-compliance with an ECA. Usually, though, a contravention of an ECA is also a contravention of the Environmental Protection Act. Section 186 of the Environmental Protection Act lists out what our contravention is, and um, that includes uh, financial fees. You can check in the, I could, I have it here, but I won't read it out. It won't take too long, but there are penalties, financial penalties that they can in, um, impose on the, propon the proponent and they can also issue tickets and provincial office orders uh, depending on what the non-compliance issue is. Then I got a question about the fire department and if they're equipped to deal with digesters. Um, so during the construction and before operation, we do work with the fire department. Um, we bring them to the facility and show them how the facility operates and what processes are involved on the site so that they are familiar with it. That was, those were the questions I received except the one for Brian. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Um, the one from Brian. Brian. Um, so I have a lot of last name. Brian Brancher. Okay. I, I don't know if there was a specific question in that email. Um, it was just some um, comments. I didn't, I didn't put a specific question. Um, as well? No. Okay. So yeah, um, and, and, and we're aware of the discussion and the comments, and, and we're going to go back through them, and, and we're going to work towards a yeah. compiling. Um, a, a review and a, and a list of frequently asked questions and, and try to get the information out. Um, I know there was a, a question um, that was uh, sent to the mayor um, from uh, Mary Ann Torborolo um, that was sent, um, and I believe it was looking for clarification um, on the um, I believe it was submitted was the uh, parts of the uh, uh, approval from NACP or their, their application form, um, which did break down the types of, of, of um, approvals that they do. 
And, and I think because the one this one had a waste disposal site processing site selected uh, was was the question for clarification. Um, so this is obviously the, the provincial um, how they break down their their approvals, um, which is which is different than um, the zoning and, and the uses and the definitions that are in the bylaw. Um, so what how how the province term does terminology is different than and how the township. Um, implements its so violent and, and makes its definition so that it, that is a separate issue so um so that's all i can probably speak to on, on that okay so certainly right now uh we do have some uh, some hands raised so uh we will start with the first uh question who is it unless i can't see it, it it's al my name is oh, okay al's here yeah correct yeah okay go ahead al Okay, so just uh, first, um, I'm retired DuPont employee. I am a professional engineer, worked in the environmental field for 20 some years. Um, I have my first question, I have many, I'll, I'll jump back in the queue after my question, hopefully get back in with some others. Um, the, the township calls this a production facility and so it's zoned appropriately for the land. That is uh, where it is. However, the MECP, calls this a waste disposal site. They don't call it a manufacturing facility. So what is the township going to do to try and, and understand the, the difference here between the two? We don't call it that. The ministry itself calls it that. So if it's called a waste disposal facility, that would that not change, you know, if this thing can go in, in this particular location? Did you respond to that? Okay. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, and I understand that's part of the confusion is the fact that the ministry refers to it on, on their approvals as a, as a waste disposal site. Um, the, the planning opinions and the legal opinion was aware of that, but it, it, it ultimately bounces to our zoning bylaw and how the definition of manufacturing um, is, is worded. Um, the, the legal opinion that we've been provided um, has, has indicated that it does qualify as a manufacturing uh, waste is not being disposed of on site. It, 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 materials are being brought in and, and, and turned into something else. So uh, it's different than our landfill sites, um, which is it has a different definition. So that that's the the planning opinion we've been provided on that. So so it's a separate. Our, we we implement our own zoning bylaw, um, which is a separate than than the provincial approval, which has its own terminology. Is the provincial approval not the law here? No, so the, the provincial, from a provincial perspective, they approve the ECAs and then they uh, put it back on the municipalities to, from a zoning perspective and a site plan control. So two, two totally separate legislations. Okay, we'll go to the next, uh, next question. Is uh, Deborah? Oh, no, no, sorry, no. Uh, Sorry. Hey, it's actually it, Scott. Yeah, it's Scott. Hi. Um, I okay. just want to tie tie in with that question because when you, I've heard your answer, and it doesn't fit at all with your waste or with your zoning bylaws, and specifically when you go to WD which is a waste disposal zone, under the additional provisions, 715, it specifically mentions waste to energy, and it also specifically mentions a uh, uh, M M uh, E C P approval is required so these are additional provisions that only appear on wd zone properties which which ties in exactly with the description here and it doesn't appear in any of the mp zoning which this property is so clearly clearly there's a total discrepancy here and it's not representing the intentions of Augusta's bylaws and any reasonable man would, would, or woman 
would not come up with that conclusion. And you're asking the constituents to bite the bullet on this. It's a it's it it's ridiculous. It's a comment. I don't know. It's a comment. Yeah, a not a question. Okay. No, certainly. I think you know uh, your comment is fair, and certainly MECP looks at it from a ECA perspective, and and certainly from our zoning bylaw, we look at it based on our our language within the our zoning bylaw, which has been uh, deemed approved by two planners, professional planners, as well as a, a legal lawyer who has reviewed our zoning bylaw amendment and has made the opinion that. It fits within uh, manufacturing. Will you provide that legal opinion to the residents? I'll certainly get uh, permission from the lawyer to release it, but certainly if he does, I'll certainly release that for sure. Okay, I would appreciate that. Okay. Next, who's next? Uh, The David Price is yeah. David Price. Yes, thank you. Um, they stole my questions on the manufacturing and zoning and uh, and waste disposal. I fully, I fully disagree with your answer, even though it's the planners and legal opinion. But my second question yeah. would be, um, in in regards to the trucking of six trucks per hour during seven a.m. to seven p.m. Um, is it actually not 12 trucks since they will enter and then they will leave? So the congestion, traffic, noise, et cetera, is really 12 disruptions per hour? Or are you saying they will be limited to three trucks per hour um, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. to account for the in and out to the maximum number of six in and outs? Can you clarify that? And the second part of that is, do you have the power to, to limit that number so that the disruptions to the area um, are minimized. Thank you. Sure, so it's uh, six trucks, so the truck has to go in and leave. So it can, six coming in and six leaving. So it's then 12 leave. trucks per hour Thanks. that will be disrupted in the area. Not an hour. Um, well, the, provision in the ECA is that it can't be more than six within an hour. So then the second question was in regards to um, Oh, can it be less? Or so can it be less or limitations? That was so that the six, the limit that's in there, that's a, a ministry limit for noise. Um, it, it's not that we will be taking six an hour. It's that that's what the limit is, that it cannot be more. Um, Right. Does council I have the? No, just the last piece. Does council have the uh, approval to limit? So, if the ministry puts the maximum is six per hour, which is really twelve when you count in and out, does council and and our municipality have the ability to limit what that number is to ensure the disruption to residents has been minimized? Certainly, I don't think I have that answer, David, but certainly what we'll do is we'll do a follow up and uh, with legal and we'll get that opinion for sure. Thank you for taking my question. Yep. Okay. I guess it's back to all them. Um, so my next question is around the older bylaw. Is this township going to work on an older bylaw? Uh, such that can protect the residents here because this plant will undoubtedly at some point cause a stink. It doesn't matter what things you put into place, emissions will happen, they will get out to the neighborhood. So, what is the township going to do around an older bylaw? No, so, certainly something that the planner and myself were talking about today and something that uh, we'll certainly look into. Now, we cannot contravene what MECP has governed in their ECA. But we can certainly put some measures in place that uh, helps mitigate anything that MECP has in there. So that's certainly on our radar and something that we're going to certainly look into. You you can certainly go more stringent than the MECP if you so choose. Correct. But we have there's limitations on the fact that we can't make it too stringent that uh, it does not meet the site plan approval. So we have to make sure that we're cautious on what restrictions we put in so that it does not become impossible for the the H and D properties to meet.
Okay. Uh -huh. David, is it David? David again? David? There was a written question right. from somebody who had it. Suzanne. Oh. Oh, I just thought about that. Oh, maybe in the chat too. You can you just so on? that I think because they're, sure. they're handling can you, it. Uh, if you go to the top, if there's a chat. Yeah. yeah. Hit that. Uh, there's some questions. Okay. Okay, we'll do a couple of the chat questions first and then we'll, we'll go back. back. Oh, that was a great suggestion, Karen. <laughs> you should have seen that earlier. Thank you. <laughs> Please move my student one's feedback. Okay, here. Uh, so, uh, question by Jamie and Helen Harper. How long do the carbon filters last and how long does it take to replace them? Sure. So, the carbon filters are sized to last between uh, like around 12 months. Uh, they are monitored continuously. Um, and to replace them, it's an easy process. The, um, it's basically a, a cylindrical vessel with the carbon media in it. So the lid is removed and the media is uh, taken out um, and put into an enclosed truck and removed from the facility. Um, so it's about a day process uh, to do that. And while that's being done, then one of the other odor control vessels is being used. Um. Are there still any issues with the digester in London that you're aware of, Claire? I'm not aware, but I, um, it's not something that I check from day to day. Uh, I know that they were required to do a lot of changes to their facility. Uh, okay. Susan and Donald Smart, where does the digest get trucked to and does it have an odor? Sure. So the digestate actually doesn't have uh, an odor in the way that you think of um, food waste having an odor. Uh, during the process in the tanks, what's actually the odorous compounds are being consumed by the bacteria and that's kind of, that's how they make the biogas. Um, so it's trucked off site to um, where it's stored until it can be land applied. Uh, and it will be certified as a fertilizer and subject to the fertilizer, uh, Canadian Food Inspection Fertilizer Act. Um, there's another one. What happens to any non-organics or foreign items, i.e. plastics, etc., that are not put in the digesters? Are they removed and where are they each removed to? And are they collected on the grounds and shipped back out? When shipped out, are they in a filter truck? Perfect. Good question. Uh, so all of the inorganic matter that's removed from the organics is put into um, a closed compaction bin and that bin is connected to the odor control system. Um, when it's time to remove that bin from the site, a truck removes it um, and brings it to landfill. Uh, and and all of that happens, it's all enclosed, it's all in the building, so that's not, um, the inorganics aren't piled up anywhere and saved. They go directly from the processing equipment into a, a bin that's connected to the odor control system and removed from site to a landfill. So, Barb and Sandra, what kind of organic materials can we expect? Sure. So, the permit allows for um, source separated organics, so that's um, green bin waste. So. Food waste that from from people's homes and also from manufacturing, but we can get if there's say there's a milk processor and they have off-spec milk, we can take that. Um, any food processing waste there is in the permit um, quite a detailed list of the allowed and not allowed feedstocks. I can't have listed to you off the top of my head, but there's like brewery waste is on there. Um, I don't does somebody have that. It's quite stipulated, and if your item is not on the list that's in your ECA waste permit, you're not allowed to bring it to the facility. You have to apply for special permission to have it added to your permit. Uh, sorry that I can't list all of them, but it's food processing waste and green bin waste is the main the main feedstocks. Is it in the air one? Yeah, no, it's in the waste. It's in the waste. 
And for sure, we can supply you with that list. I'm sorry, I don't know what else that's going to We'll certainly we'll put that as part of the um, the information we put online. It's quite a specific list. Um, and there's a list that says what you can't bring. So we can't bring um, any biosolids. We can't bring any hazardous organic wastes. Uh, we can't bring material off of airplanes. Um, so the list is quite specific on what you can and cannot sure. bring. You want to go through the list? I, we can read it out loud. Okay. Yeah, sure. I can, I can just quickly run through the list that they're approved for. Uh, bakeries, confectionery products. Excuse me, processing facilities. Uh, dairy, I'm sorry, do you want to take it yep. over? Yep. Sorry, I'm going to take all my apologies. Dairies and facilities that process dairy products, fruit and vegetable processing facilities, cereal and grain processing facilities, oil seed processing facilities, snack food processing facilities, snack food manufacturing facilities, breweries and distillery grains, wineries, beverage manufacturing facilities, food processing facilities, grocery stores, food distribution companies, milling facilities, fruit and vegetable packing facilities, pet food manufacturing, food waste from restaurants, food service facilities, correctional facilities, alcohols, beer and other spirits, organic waste from agricultural sources limited to non pisherable animal food and crop residues, food grade fats, oils and grease residues, and production of ethanol or biodiesel. Well, that's a long list. It's on page 14 of the ECA for, for waste. <coughs> Anything else from the chat? Uh, or that it was it? Okay. Patrick. So Patrick, I think, is next. Do you want to unmute Patrick and... Patricia. Oh, sorry, Patricia, sorry. That's us, right? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm not Patricia. I, I'm lucky enough to be married to her. Uh, you have uh, answered one of my questions as what is the lifespan of the carbon filters. But my next question is, so where do they go? They don't last forever, so what happens to them? The what media happens? from the carbon filter um, can be landfill. Which? Landfill. Okay, so they wind up in a landfill. Whereabouts is that going to be? Where is, that? where is it? Where is it? Um, the specific landfill that the proponent has selected, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, but it's a long way away from here, right? Where the proponent accepts that material. Okay, next question. Uh, Laura? Hi there. Uh, I am a resident of 1506 County Road 2. I am a retired engineer and high school chemistry teacher. Um, we know that there is no industry ever anywhere that does not release material at some point. It no system is perfect. So there will be, as Alan said earlier, a stink at some point. So my question is, we have the Ministry of the Environment that complaints can be um, sent to. They're a government agency. That takes a lot of time for anything to get processed through there. I don't know if they have to be present to witness um, a release and you know just not in the right place at the right time uh sometimes it's very much uh makes much more economic sense for a company to simply pay the fines than it does to uh actually remedy the problem so how can we be assured that that's not going to happen and what it comes down to is as our counselors what will you do for us as residents who um need to be able to enjoy our properties and also maintain that equity in our properties for um, our care later in life. What will you do when the Minister of the Environment does not respond in a satisfactory manner? I think the question is 
for the township. So, from an order, so do you know what the process is from an order complaint to MECP at all, Claire? Oh, it's directly to the district office. So there in Kingston, there's a phone number to call for order complaints. Um, so the response should be quick. If, if fines are made, um, the facility would be shut down if the changes aren't made in time. There is for more uh, for quicker reaction, the public liaison committee that will be formed. So that's people from the community on it. Um, that committee hasn't been formed yet, but that would meet regularly to discuss any order complaints. And then certainly from a township perspective, uh, Laura, we would have a, we're looking at an order control as well that will supplement the MECP uh, order order ECA. So we'll have some uh, certainly some um, recommendations that we can enforce on, on our end as well, too. OK, thank you. Okay, so my turn again. Um, so at the beginning, uh, it was mentioned that uh, you're having this meeting. Yeah, it's nice. You're listening to people vent a little bit, um, but and then there would be some action taken. So I have yet to see any action or an action plan. So my question is, after this meeting, what actionable items is the township going to do and how are you going to let the, the residents know what you are doing? So it's nice that you can talk and yeah, you can sit back and listen, but we've yet to see very little being done. So certainly, um, you know, from our perspective is we're taking as much information in as we can. And, and uh, yeah. you know, certainly from, from my perspective and from our planner, uh, we're coming in kind of new to this. Uh, this was something I think that believe that started back in 2018 or 19. So we're trying to get up to speed a little bit on, on what has transpired over the last two years, but certainly working with the proponent and the, their consultant is to take all this information in so that we can make sure that we mitigate as much risk as we can and put in safeguard measures that may, might be above and beyond MECP uh, as we go through the site plan process. So by no means is it, is it done yet, but we'll be working with the consultant and the proponents to make sure that you know things are, are in place and, and that we can uh, Hopefully, you know, meet uh, meet certain guidelines that uh, will make it uh, hopefully uh, still a good operations are, are, uh, moving forward. So that, that's not a very good answer, I'm afraid. Um, you're, you're working with the proponent and with the consultant, yet it's yep. the it, it's all the residents who have you know some people would have voted you into this place to represent us. So what are you going to do with communicating with the residents and doing something with the residents? The proponent, they don't. They want to get in their plant. They don't care about anything mm -hmm. else. Yep. So, what is your action plan with the residents? So, you know, this is the first step, I think, in, in engaging with the residents to to understand the concerns. And and as I indicated before, our plan is going to be to take all this information, have responses to all the questions that either A did not get answered tonight or or moving forward. We'll be looking at putting some bylaws in that will look for input from from the public as well. Uh, order control and stuff, and certainly looking at engaging external consultants, EVB engineering and other uh, external consultants to help assist us. But you know, certainly right now the MECP approval has been has been granted. So the next phase is is, is a site plan control, which uh, we'll we'll continue to work with council and and myself and our planner and and consultants to to make sure. But certainly moving forward, we want to keep all this information on our website to keep the residents, you know apprised of everything that's going on. Not much. Um, was that, uh, Patricia? Uh, sorry, you answered my question earlier, so I think. Oh, OK. OK, sorry. Okay, no sorry. Problem. David? Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Jillian, David's wife, the better half. Um, <laughs> so a couple of things, given that we have and are trying to build a tourism um, industry here in this area, thanks to the St. Lawrence River, has RTO9 or Brockville Tourism, have any of those individuals um, or bodies been included 
in looking at the impact possibly um, to this industry? I mean, a prime example is we can't get a bike lane on the highway. Um, so, you know, it, it, it appears to me that um, it, we're a little bit in, we've got blinders on, if you will. Now, the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, I would caution you when trying to simply meet a standard um, when we're talking about compliance. Um, anybody can meet a standard, but as a resident of this neighborhood, um, I am imposing upon you to exceed that standard. Um, and I'd like to see an action plan um, very specifically. Yes, you're new to the position, et cetera, but specifically we need to see an action plan because i think that that would go a long way in boosting our confidence in a process which has been somewhat muddied in the past okay no that's a fair comment it's certainly something we'll take into consideration for sure is there people in the chat anyone else in the chat at all uh... Um, how oh, down at the bottom there? Oh, this one here, okay. Um, yeah, so who will be responsible to pay for the road construction when there's going to be to the 85, 84 to 96 more trucks per day on our beautiful County Road 2? Uh, that would be part of the uh, counties reviewing the traffic study. So they would, they would be able to determine if there's any costs associated with any road uh, maintenance or whatever like that, but that would be done through the review the review process. Um, why has there not been any consideration to minimize the traffic on our roadways by creating a direct dedicated route off the 401 to the site? Traffic congestion will be significant. Further, what guarantees would there be that there will not be any spillers along the roadways? Who would be responsible? What will mitigate or clean? So, MGO would be responsible for any spillage on, on the any any roadway. Um, and as far as a uh, direct dedicated route off the 401. Yeah, I'll just take that one on. We've been uh, I've had uh, <clears throat> three delegations now with the Ministry of uh, Transportation, get trying to get an over interchange, I should say, at Blue Church Road. I'm going to have another delegation in January with the minister. And uh, that's what we're pushing for. Because part of council's goal, I got to remember, is to build up the industrial park. And we have land there sitting that we need industry in. So I, I know maybe people don't want to see that way, but that is a mainland industrial park. So, um, so we're trying to do everything we can to help that with traffic and alternatives to, you know, don't have the traffic come through Prescott, don't have it come through Maitland, but have our own separate interchange. So uh, again, it's, it's a hard fight, but I'll keep fighting uh, as far as delegations go and uh, see what happens. That's the way uh, you kind of run the politics, so. Um, how soon do you expect the committee to be formed that includes residents for feedback? Um, that would be a question for h &D properties. Uh, okay. I expect I I'm not them, but I would expect they want to have a site plan approval to know the project is going forward before they do that. But that I can't I can't speak for them. We'll certainly follow up. Yeah. Um, just just to note, if I may, those uh, committees are quite powerful. Uh, myself, I sit on the Ivonic committee along with the fire chief and a couple of members in the maintenance community and uh, you know we review everything that way so um, you know I I look forward to something like that because that's where you get a chance to speak and everything's recorded and it's it's, it's company run so I think it's an excellent idea I think every company should do it and the other question, there doesn't seem to be much positives for residents. We'd like to know what your thoughts on how we are benefiting from it. And I think to the mayor's point is, is we're building up our industrial or our industrial park. Um, but certainly uh, from a planning perspective, we have to follow the rules that are, that are laid out under the Planning Act uh, and in accordance with our bylaws. So that's certainly what we're what we're in the process of doing right now. 
and making sure that uh, you know we, we follow the rules that are that are set out for us. So. Um, yeah. I, I don't know, Claire, if you want to speak to uh, that, what it's taking out of the wayside. I mean, there is yeah. an environmental yeah. benefit um, to, to this oh, process. For sure. Um, the material that will be coming to the site is material that would be going to a landfill, um, emitting methane and CO2 at a landfill. Here it's being captured and used to heat people's homes, uh, used if you have a gas stove, um, used in all sorts of a lot of people rely on, I don't know very many people who don't use any natural gas in their life. So it's producing a, a, a renewable product, capturing emissions that are, are happening right now anyway into the atmosphere. Reduces strain on landfills in terms of holding organics that, that can have a use. It's so returning nutrients from that food waste back to our fields. So reducing the use of chemical fertilizers. Climate change is happening, and it's a, sol a solution for climate change. Uh, Dane has a question. CH4, I believe, earlier suggested that they have solar digesters in operations in South America. Can you be more specific where and share whether you have any challenges with those operations today? So, uh, to clarify, we have digesters in South America. We have them um, in Chile and in Argentina. Uh, they are not exact replicas of this site. They are um, manure and food waste based applications. So the, the presentation that we will share, uh, you did have some examples of some of the areas or some of the digester places, right? The currently Toronto ones or? Yeah, so there are, um, the city of Toronto has, has some with the same um, odor control technology provider. Uh, and we could provide, like connect you with them. Um, but the, the Dufferin site hasn't had the, any um, violations of their ECA in terms of odors. So we'll share that presentation, Dane, so that you can uh, get some sites that, uh, where it is. And if further information is needed, we can certainly connect you with Claire. OK. Uh, Okay. Yeah, it, it's Moira Riley here again. Yep. Um, first of all, uh, as one of the residents at the corner of uh, Blue Church Road and County Road 2, I fully expect there will be an interface there at this point. I understand that. But I would certainly hope that with this facility, um, they would still be exiting the 401 at the Maitland Road exit and traveling a very short distance east rather than exiting at the Blue Church Road exit and covering a much longer distance west to go to that plan. Um, my question truly though is it, it was, it arose earlier like, why have the residents not been engaged in this process? It's been the proponent, it's been the consultant. And, um, you know, I can't remember exactly how long this is going back, but I know I've had the sign up in my yard for at least a year. So at least six months prior to that, there was vocal opposition. We're talking a year and a half now. Why did it take a year and a half for the residents to be engaged if this is the first engagement tonight in this meeting? Sure, I, I can speak to that. So, um, so uh, I understand the, the the permitting. So, I understand that the, the proposal came, did come. To, I, I wasn't here at the municipality then, uh, but I do understand that the proposal did come into the township. Um, and obviously, the starting point um, is the approval of the ministry. Um, I believe that took. Did it take two years? Two years ago. Year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. There's a public consultation. Process. Yeah, there was the public consultation part of, of the, the provincial approval uh, that that process has taken pretty much from when this started uh, up until just recently. I don't know how long ago it was issued, maybe a month or so ago, um, that the province um, I, I sent us the notification of, of the approval. So um, so it wasn't permitted. Um, it hasn't been permitted for these last few years because the province hadn't, hadn't given their blessing on it. 
Um, so there was really nothing to do because there was no guarantee that it was going to get approval. So uh, now, now it's had it. Um, so and and we've had the opinions um, that the use complies with zoning. Um, so now we're working through the planning process um, to ensure that there's no negative impact um, on on residents uh, through site plan for what we're able to legally do that's within our jurisdiction. Um, we are limited somewhat. Uh, we can't. Um, we can't circumvent what the province has done, but but we certainly want to make sure that this is uh, done in a way that that the that the impacts that we can control are are minimized. So um, so that's why it's now just coming to everybody because we've been waiting like everyone else for the last two years um, for to see what the province did with it, um, and now it's approved. So that's why uh, council members uh, indicated the, the desire to reach out to the residents because. We knew there was concern um, and get try to get some information out and, and, and see what we could find out what the, all the concerns were so we can we can try to, to make sure those are addressed and are heard. Um, if I could add, sure. um, I've been through this process recently in an, another township and at one of the meetings like this, um, it was asked, we, we were planning to take the digestate out of the digester outside because it's an odorless product. And in one of those meetings, it was raised, well, is there any way you could do it indoors that would make us feel more comfortable? And so we took that feedback and put it indoors. Um, so through through that consultation, um, that was a, con a concern that was raised, and then we were able to action on it. So there is, uh, through this process, the ability to, to make changes and mm -hmm. have a conversation that way. See if hands are up or just the chat, maybe go back to the chat. The chat. Uh, uh, HD surely has secured some specific organic material. Could you be a little bit more specific what HD will be bringing to the site? HD first pitched it would be organic waste from Tim Hortons, specifically coffee grounds and donuts. Yeah, so. Um, I'm not H&D Properties. I can't speak to exactly what they have secured. I do know that people with waste, they will not commit to bringing, giving you their waste until you have a facility. Um, they don't want to get into a contract saying, we'll bring you this, and then you have, they have nowhere to bring it. Um, so I'm sure H&D Properties have had lots of discussions with lots of people, but um, those contracts tend to be put into place once there's actually a facility. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes, I have a question, David Price. Yes. Um, I just want to follow back up with Moyer, uh, Moyer's question, because uh, it also links back to the original question and engagement. Um, the the shame of it all i know you're new but the shame of it all it started before and the answers we got was we don't have anything so we can't do anything and because you couldn't do anything we couldn't do anything and therefore the ministry just approves it so the 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 engagement that you're saying now uh, it, it's a little late because it's already approved and now you're dealing with it but since then you've already been engaged with planners uh lawyers and have already determined that that list of 100 types of waste, oh, don't worry, it's not waste, we're a manufacturing plant, we're not a waste disposal and processing plant, which is clearly what it is and what you describe based on the materials going in and out. You can see why we're a little raw, a little jaded on the process and the support that we have from, from, from council and the municipality. When we go to fight, the Ministry of Environment in Kingston, it would be nice if our municipality fought for us, but as you've identified, oh, well, we'll have a committee we can sit on and then we can fight when we want and they'll probably give us an answer quickly, but you're washing your hands of everything. You're just sitting back with your planners and lawyers and saying, how do we not get sued and how do we allow this business to come here? Because we're trying to promote business. Again, no real resident 
true engagement of listening to what it is and trying to see, well, how do we fight for the residents? You're not really explaining any of that. Hopefully within the action plans that you put forth, they can be a little more proactive before something happens and you start to get the complaints, how you can get involved to support the residents and proactively start to look at solutions versus reactively just waiting. Oh, it's approved. Now we can't do anything. We can't fight the Ministry of the Environment. So that's really my question and comment. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And certainly, you know, um, part of the process we still have is, is a site plan. And as Melissa said, is that, um, you know, understanding the concerns and issues, you know, we're certainly working with the consultant on ensuring those safeguard measures are in place. And, um, you know, that we, this is not, to me, I don't think this is the end of the discussion. So certainly I do appreciate the fact of an action plan and something that we will work towards in ensuring that information is disseminated out to the public. Um, but there's limitations on what we can do under the Planning Act um, as far as uh, public process. Um, through the MECP, I know it, there was a public process as well, and if I believe there were 74 comments received uh, from MECP as they made their decision on the ECA approval. Uh, one of those submissions were for the township in regards to concerns that we had. So certainly I think from an uh, MECP perspective, uh, with some of the, the conditions they have in their ECA approval. I think they did to listen to some of the comments that were provided, but certainly uh, we'll continue to get feedback and, and continue this conversation moving forward. If I could yes. just add to sure. that. Uh, so just so the, the, the residents are aware, like we, we won't, just because they get approval and, and everything's approved, the township's still going to be there for you. Um, mm -hmm. And the township will advocate for you if there's a complaint and the township will contact the Ministry of the Environment mm -hmm. um, to, to help facilitate that. I had a resident in this week uh, with another issue and I contacted the ministry directly and had a response to them by the end of the day. I, I can't say that's always the case, but, but our doors are open. You, you can reach me by phone or email. We will always advocate for the residents, and if there's a way that we can reach out to the sure. ministry directly, uh, we will certainly do that um, and, and help in any way that we can. Um, I, I just don't want everyone to get the impression that, that the residents are alone in this. The township is still there and staff are still here for you. Um, if, if there's anything that I can do, I, I please reach out at any time, uh, and I'm happy to talk to anyone. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I'll see you again. I have another one for you. Um, so sure. um, good words there, but uh, I guess what we've seen so far is not what you've just said. Sorry. Um, yeah, you want to get the residents involved, whatnot, but we've not seen much of that. Um, and, and did the action plan, you know, in terms of this whole zoning, we gave you some clear messages on that. Uh, let's hopefully you, you know, revisit that uh, with the right frame of mind that this is a waste facility and not a manufacturing facility and then come to some different conclusion. So this, Claire, if, if she's still on the call from CH4, I have a question for you. Um, yes, she is. Yeah, she's here. So you are using BioRAM as uh, your preferred supplier for odor abatement. Um, have you used BioRAM for anaerobic digesters such as what you're proposing here? I guess that's part two of that. Uh, would you be able to disclose um, who, where these other plants are located and respective sizes of those facilities, if they are indeed anaerobic digesters, in comparison to the size of the one that is being proposed here? Yes, so we are using Myram. Um, some of the facilities, CH4 specifically, has, hasn't used them before in this type of application. Uh, but they have been used by other anaerobic digesters within Ontario, and I could get you that information. I don't have it no, I don't right now. It was listed right. in my slides. Um, so hopefully a township you can provide to the township and they can make it available to all of the residents here. Mm -hmm. and, and again, we're, sure. I'm trying to understand relative sizes of those facilities compared to what is being brought in here. And so whether by waste mm -hmm. age, by number of trucks, by whatever. Sure. Okay, no, we'll certainly get gather that information and we'll send it out to the email list that we have from this meeting. Well, I see a hand up here, uh, Patricia. You want to just unmute yourself? 
Sorry, we can't hear you. You're on, you're on mute. You're going to have to unmute yourself. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. You know, okay. Somebody alluded earlier to the question of it coming down the Blue Church Road instead, which solves absolutely nothing. You're simply, you're, what you're doing is either way, you've got trucks thundering along number two highway, whether they come from the east or the west is immaterial. In either case, you're coming through prime residential area. You're coming through a prime tourist area where we cannot even get a bike lane for cyclists to go in, uh, in safety. And if this is gonna help this, I don't think so. I'll, I'll take that one. I, I know I'm not getting much respect tonight on council, but I, I look forward to that. So County Road 2, first of all, I've been fighting for that. As a councillor, a county's councillor, I have said we need, right, uh, we need paved shoulders on the side of the road, County Road 2. But you got to understand, I'm one mayor amongst 10 mayors trying to fight for the dollar. And uh, there's a lot of things happening in council. I agree. Highway 43 and everything else. But man, that's my main priority when I go to county's council is to fight for County Road 2. Two of the councillors right now, myself and another councillor, live within three kilometers of the, uh, the digester. And I live on the eastern side of it. Actually, the wind blows from west to east. So do I have concerns? Yes, I have concerns. I also sat on the last council, and I can tell you right now that um, it was kind of a shambles right from the start because we had the proponent going door to door, handing out letters. The township knew nothing about it at all until we started getting phone calls. And uh, that was the first mistake made. But as a township, we said, okay, what's going on? And uh, we dug into it. And uh, I can guarantee you the last council each council member had at least 50 questions they submitted to the CAO at that time, and they were submitted to MOE, or Ministry of Environment, because we wanted the answers too. Then we took on the, uh, the basically the uh, consultants, EBB, and we said we need more to that. And then, based, then we went and saw some digesters. There's digesters very close in this area, you know, taking foods and everything out from craft foods. So um, anyway, we went to visit a couple of them, didn't have a problem. But our doubt is still there because we want to do what's best for the residents. So we have a township of 7,400 people. And yes, people say, we don't care about the legalities. I'm sorry, as head of council, I have to be concerned. I do not want this township to be sued. Okay, so call it what it may, but that's my job. You know, protect the, all the residents of this township. So we're trying to think of every way, you know, that we can help. And, uh, you know, when the, the mighty email list starts and it just takes one person to basically start these blasts, the, this staff and council can't keep up with it. You know, that's why we waited and we wanted the absolute truth and the facts. And, uh, I, you know, I seen all. I got 300 emails. I say, so I heard all of it. But again, I look at the facts, and a big concern is Ministry of Environment. You know, they're the leading authority on this. So anyway, we're going to follow. I'm just going to close this up. Um, I just want to thank everyone for attending this online information session. We have explained our process as a municipality and will follow the process reasonably and legally. If you have further questions concerning the process, please contact us by email at the, town, at the township office. Again, thank you for attending. I thank my, my peers here in the room for answering their questions. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you.